Good morning and welcome back uh, to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and uh, cinema. So, today we are going to continue uh, our discussions on the accounts of the survivor. Uh, our discussion will be on an important work, a seminal work uh, by Jyotir Moi Devi, uh, the much acclaimed uh, novel called uh, Epar Ganga, Opar Ganga in uh, Bengali and it has been translated uh, as the river churning. So, Epar Ganga, Opar Ganga or the river churning uh, by Jyotir Moi Devi, it was uh, originally written in, it was originally written in 1967 and it is an epoch making novel that explained the broader context of uh, the literature of partition and its, foca its focus has been on uh, the theme of uh, dislocation and uh, violence on the woman. So, uh, Epar Ganga, Upar Ganga first uh, was published, was first published in 1967 uh, in Bengali as Itihashe Sri Parva or women's uh, chapter in history uh, in the annual issue of the prestigious Bengali periodical. So, prestigious Bengali periodical Probashi. Now, Epar Ganga, Upar Ganga uh, talks about how the subject of a dislocation uh, can be uh, explored with insight and uh, sensitivity and it narrates the human history of partition once again and, and tries to uh, fill the gaps that uh, have been created by the conventional nationalist historiography of freedom movement. The novel disrupts uh, the representative economy of female chastity and honor that is imagined uh, around or that centers the body of the woman and the patriarchal values that uh, inform uh, such an economy. So, the river churning's uh, female protagonist Sutara Datta is an embodied subject for whom victimization registers at multiple levels at the level of the body, uh, at the level of uh, the psyche and then at the level of the society. So, the stronger emphasis on the gendered refugee is uh, created in the novel by Jyotir Mui Devi uh, by gendering the category of the refugee itself. So, uh, all refugees in this story are shown as uh, women. So, the focus uh, the, the discourse of, of uh, partition violence in the uh, novel is uh, fashioned through the experiences that women from different parts of India have uh, suffered. So, so the violence uh, fr through the violence that uh, women from different parts of India have suffered. So, the discourse of uh, partition violence is uh, shaped uh, or fashioned uh, in the novel through, uh, uh, through uh, locating on the uh, or, or through focusing on the experiences of women from different parts of India and uh, their sufferance. So, uh, the river churning constructs a critique that uh, applied not only to the refugee women uh, and uh, the extraordinary situation of, of, of upheaval, the extraordinary situation of upheaval that uh, they faced, but the historical condition of being a woman in general uh, in a given social context. So, uh, it is not only talking about, it is uh, placing, it is locating the violence of partition within the larger uh, context of patriarchal violence that a woman uh, encounters on an everyday basis. So, uh, it speaks to the contradictory demands of a representation by both the historical and the traumatic. So, river churning relates women's marginality within the linguistic community uh, to the absence of the women's chapter within the collective uh, memory and uh, institutional history. So, river churning is uh, at the outset we see in the preface uh, 
uh, Jyotirmoyi Devi is uh, referring to uh, Mahabharat. There is an allusion to Mahabharat and how the women's chapter is deliberately silenced. There, she says that there is no ink to actually uh, depict, to delineate what happened to the women, to uh, describe the fate of the women. And so, this is actually referring to uh, the systematic erasure of the uh, gender dimension in the public history, in the public memory of the partition. So, the novel portrays the standpoint of the marginal refugee woman and how the uh, possibility and even permissibility of uh, available language uh, has a gendered nature. The novel uh, Jyotirmoyi Devi wants to probe uh, why uh, it is not possible for uh, the, the refugee woman to speak about her experience. So, the novel is uh, set, uh, it is written against the backdrop of uh, the 1946 Noakhali riots in uh, pre-partition East Bengal uh, and it talks about uh, the experience, the encounters of a, uh, an allegedly polluted refugee woman in Calcutta and Delhi. The critics of this novel such as uh, Jashodhara Bakchi and uh, Shubharanjan Dashgupta say uh, that there though there is a general belief though there is a general belief that rape was less marked a presence in the bengal partition the fear of rape was enough to marginalize women and to prevent them from being accepted by their own community so the story the plot of uh, the river churning uh, goes like this uh, it centers the life of sutara datta who is the daughter of a, a, a Bhadralok a schoolmaster in a village that is located in the Noakhali district of East Bengal. During the pre-partition communal riots uh, of 1946, the local Muslim subalterns mainly from the Dalit peasant groups uh, who also work as domestics in uh, Sutara's uh, homestead come and kill her father. They most probably rape and abduct her mother and sister which has been uh, implied but never directly mentioned in the text and these peasants burn down their ancestral homestead. The village schoolmasters, uh, the village school's headmaster uh, Tamijuddin Sahib, uh, a neighbor, uh, a Muslim neighbor uh, rescues Sutara and uh, after the subsiding of the riots, he consigns her to her brother's custody in Calcutta. Uh, now, in her brother's uh, in-law's house in Calcutta, uh, it is a joint middle class joint family setup. Uh, Sutara faces discrimination and she is treated as an untouchable, uh, because she is a refugee orphan from East Bengal and uh, people would, uh, I mean members in the family would. Uh, uh, guess uh, that uh, she has, uh, so, so she is, because she is a refugee orphan from East Bengal who has uh, allegedly lost her caste by uh, living with the uh, Muslims in a Muslim man's uh, house and uh, also uh, tacitly, although not directly said, uh, tacitly because uh, people uh, imagine people uh, guess that she has been raped. Uh, so, her brother's relatives uh, send her to the boarding school because she is not accepted within the joint uh, family setup. She is sent to boarding school and in a course of time, in the course of time she grows up to become uh, a history teacher in a women's college in Delhi. So, her presence, her post partition presence in Calcutta and in Delhi uh, is marked by a silence about the entire episode uh, or in Noakhali. So, there is a silence on her part about the Noakhali episode and there is a persistent pain that is uh, uh, choking her. Uh, so, 
she leads a sequestered life uh, until uh, a, a man called Pramod uh, proposes to marry her. So, in the first part of the novel, uh, the, the narrative is uh, recounted as a flashback and uh, there is a narration uh, I mean uh, the, 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 the narrative is recounted as a flashback and uh, it tells the reader about the onslaught on the family by Muslim peasants. So, there are several details about the physical violence done to Sutara, but the narrative does not uh, actually uh, tell us uh, whether the violence has a sexual uh, meaning or a sexual aspect. So, one does not know for sure if Sutara has been raped. She is uh, brought back to life, she is, uh, she is uh, rescued and nursed by uh, the, neighbor Temi, uh, the neighbor Tamij Sahib and his family. So, after regaining her health, she wants to be connected to her family members in Calcutta who actually acquire, who are, who are actually reluctant to take her back. However, Tamiz Sahib and his sons uh, risk their own lives uh, while accompanying uh, Sutara to Calcutta and then uh, they reunite her to her uh, to, to, the survive, to the surviving uh, members of her family. They, re, uh, they unite her to the surviving members of her family. Uh, now, uh, the second part is also uh, recounted as a flashback. It tells the story of Sutara from the time of coming to Calcutta uh, as a uh, familyless refugee woman until the present time, present moment of the narration. So, uh, she is considered as tainted, as polluted by the members of her brother's in law's uh, family, and uh, although uh, it is not made explicit. Um, the stigma of a possible rape also remains part of this uh, of, of this alleged uh, notion of pollution, uh, alleged notion of pollution uh, centering uh, Sutara. So, she is especially excluded from the kitchen and not allowed to touch the drinking water. And so, she grows up uh, with uh, the, uh, the the most pressing threat felt. Uh, so, from the moment Sutara arrives uh, and uh, starts to live in the house, there is a pressing threat felt by the uh, the host family, uh, especially the women in the family, and uh, the threat uh, is posed in the form of her sexuality. Her sexuality is viewed as that of an outcast, unmarried and unmarriageable woman uh, who could actually uh, pollute the rest of the members. So, uh, in the uh, plot line in, in, the, in the novel, we see there are obsessive discussions of Sutara's problems in the family. And so, it becomes the problem of Sutara. It slips into a kind of uh, uh, you know phrase. Uh, Sutara is uh, almost, uh, Sutara becomes synonymous with problem, with crisis that the hosts uh, face as a result of having her. So, uh, I mean uh, uh, the text actually uses the phrase Sutara problem or Sutara samasya. So, uh, this actually echoes the, this reverberates the larger uh, you know situation where women's question posed a huge threat to the idea of a sanctified and a morally uh, you know righteous nation. And so, the process of uh, cleansing was uh, rigorously followed at all levels of society. So, Sutara is uh, perceived as a predicament and uh, as a threat or a nuisance. Uh, she echoes the refugee problem uh, that, uh, that uh, the host society uh, Calcutta and West Bengal 
was going through at that time. So, Sutara problem echoes the rhetoric of the refugee problem uh, posed by the East Bengali refugees to Calcutta and West Bengal. So, in the third part of the novel, uh, we see Sutara moving to Delhi as a lecturer of history and living there as an outcast from her larger community in Calcutta. Even as she visits uh, one of the family occasions, she uh, joins her family um, uh, to attend a, a wedding. She is, uh, she is treated as uh, an outsider, she is treated, I mean she, uh, she is treated as someone unwanted and it uh, ends uh, in her, her uh, you know, her reunion with the family ends in utter uh, humiliation. So, uh, towards the end of the novel, we see uh, Tamijuddin uh, uh, Sahib's wife uh, proposes a match between her son Aziz and Sutara, uh, but Sutara rejects such a match. And so, at the end of the book, uh, the gentleman called uh, Pramod proposes marriage to her, and although it is not stated, in all probability, it is, uh, I mean, it is implied, it is strongly indicated that Sutara accepts uh, the proposal. Now, uh, critics uh, have uh, read uh, this uh, novel uh, as, uh, as a rich site that uh, talks about uh, women's, uh, you know, uh, the, the question of uh, women's uh, bodily honor. Uh, the question of what is speakable and uh, the, the problem of uh, a socially permissible language uh, to describe the woman's suffering. So, Polumi Chakraborty for example, argued Polumi Chakraborty critics the gendered limitations of the socially possible language. So, uh, the question of what could be said, how much could be said, the threshold that needed to be crossed and who would believe such a woman. So, Jyotirmoy Devi portrays the silence of the surviving victims uh, and uh, the silence that is institution, uh, the silence that is institutionalized at various levels. For example, there is a, a prohibition uh, on the survivors uh, in, 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 in the hostel uh, where Sutara is uh, relocated in the hostel that is run by the missionaries, uh, where Sutara is relocated, there is an institutional prohibition uh, on the survivors to talk about, about talking uh, uh, on their experiences. So, uh, although at a later stage uh, she is not bound by such institutional prohibition, silence uh, persists she cannot, Sutara cannot overcome the silence and put into words the pain that she feels or the violence that uh, is uh, in her mind. In fact, her mind becomes an, a blind spot that the reader never gets to know. How much she knows? Does she know? And what does she know? Sutara herself remembers nothing between uh, the moment of uh, blackout and her regaining consciousness uh, several days later in uh, the house of Tamij Sahib. But this would also be uh, something problematic to say that she knows nothing. Like I said, it is uh, the, the uh, I mean how much uh, the, the degree of remembrance, the, the extent of what is remembered and how it is remembered is uh, something that the reader is never. Um, the river, the, the reader uh, is uh, never, uh, you know, uh, permitted to uh, explore. The reader never gets to know what Sutara, uh, uh, how much Sutara remembers. So, uh, as a young girl that is deep in shock, she is uh, revisited by the fragmented memories. Uh, and uh, of course, one can understand that parts of uh, such a memory cannot be retrieved. What actually happens to Sutara is therefore, cognitively unavailable, not only to the readers and to the other characters in the novel, but to Sutara herself. So, 
this uh, notion or, or, or a tacit uh, you know understanding that she has been raped, she has indeed been raped uh, is uh, scattered throughout the novel. It is never established, uh, but there are brief uh, uh, you know references. So, uh, there is a brief mention by the narrator that Sutara was so, uh, so shattered physically and psychologically that she could not get up from the bed. And she keeps asking after regaining consciousness, she keeps asking did she fall to the ground or was she pushed down? What happened after that? So, we also have to understand that uh, here we are trying to uh, you know uh, we are trying to uh, decipher the mind not only of a female riot victim, but also that of a juvenile who may not be familiar with the idea of rape altogether. So, she does not really know what has happened to her. So, uh, and then uh, we see that the adult Sutara in hindsight uh, through retrospection is trying to study her uh, juvenile self. So, this is a very complicated uh, uh, terrain of memory that uh, the reader is being uh, the, the, the reader is uh, being taken to. So, uh, Tamish Sahib's wife uh, for example, is, is uh, using uh, uh, you know very mild or euphemistic uh, uh, you know she is uh, providing a euphemistic uh, explanation to Sutara. So, uh, or, or mild expression uh, I mean uh, Tamit Sahib's wife is uh, trying to explain uh, uh, you know Sutara in a way uh, that a child can understand. So, the sight of the fire and all those ruffians was too much for you and that is why you fainted. Uh, then you had an attack of fever from shock and you are going to be all right. So, uh, the euphemism uh, is a way of uh, averting of dodging uh, dodging the, 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 the you know encounter with the experience in the form of memory head on. So, there is no uh, direct uh, facing up to the fact throughout the novel. So, uh, Aziz Tamij Saab's uh, elder son later remembers this night and speaks of finding Sutara as a bundle of clothes that are lying in a pool of blood. So, beyond these uh, fragmentary somewhat contradictory details no other specifics of the assault on Sutara are disclosed by the narrator. Now, there are several uh, critical comments regarding uh, the silence uh, that pervades in the novel throughout the novel. Uh, so, the, the pervasive silence throughout the novel. So, uh, Bali, uh, so, there are several critical uh, critics commenting on the pervasive silence uh, that uh, uh, you know the pervasive silence throughout uh, the river churning. Uh, for example, uh, Debali Mukherjee Leonard uh, says that there is no scope for reading the unspoken by the author narrator as an act of uncritical shame or as a residual prudery of a post Victorian novelist. Because uh, so, Mukherjee Leonard would go on to say uh, or, or argue that uh, the absence of the word rape or any direct description does not uh, simply uh, mean uh, that uh, Jyotirmoy Devi is maintaining some, some sort of uh, uh, Victorian or middle class prudery uh, as a way of refraining from using uh, a direct word such as rape. Uh, so, the Bengali equivalent of the word rape occurs quite often in uh, Devi's writing especially in her, in her essays. So, Leonard argues that the details of the assault on Sutara are omitted because the veiling of a bodily trauma through language constitutes a counter discourse to the economy of display of woman. 
So, her silence according to Leonard the way she reads the novel uh, is uh, a kind of it constitutes a counter discourse. Similarly, Jashodhara Bakshi uh, says that Sutara's experience was hit twice by patriarchy, a physical assault on a woman's body and sexuality by a male of one community that establishes his own identity by referring his territoriality over her body. And then there is affliction caused by her own community that exclude her and subject her to a prolonged and unbearable panopticist gaze by the community over Sutara's body and mind. So, because there is this panopticist gaze and there is the silence is constantly uh, kind of uh, challenged by uh, so much that is being spoken about Sutara. Uh, uh, and I mean uh, so much of the, the, the collective gaze on her body and the speculations regarding what might have happened to her. For this reason, the narrative disallows the reader's gaze to dwell on Sutara's body. Gilles Didur states that the writing sought, Devi's work sought to redirect the gaze of the reader or the researcher away from women's bodies and sexuality, which have been sites always under surveillance of community and the state. So, uh, Leonard uh, similarly argues that by keeping silent on the details of the assault, the novel recovers something of the private pain that the woman uh, suffered or rather that women suffered during partition. So, what I was trying to say is that the silence is constantly competing with and trying to outlive uh, the discussions that are uh, you know almost uh, the, the, the discussions that are uh, not directly part of uh, uh, the novel, but uh, something that uh, Devi uh, implies uh, as part of the curious gaze that, that shapes the curious gaze uh, of the family members, what, what might have happened to Sutara. So, uh, the silence wants to as a way of uh, it is it's a way of uh, reclaiming the woman's dignity uh, that uh, could have been taken away through too much discussion about uh, the, the incident uh, in her village, the episode of violence. So, uh, Didur interrupts this attempted uh, recovery project. She says these silences and ambiguities in women's stories should not be resolved, accounted for, unveiled or recovered, but they should rather be understood as women's inability to subsume their experience within projects of patriarchal modernity that has produced them in the first place. So, uh, she is critiquing this imperative to recover and so river churning is outright. Uh, the novel is an outright refusal on the face of trying to recover the woman's uh, experience and she uh, uses, uh, she is referring to Gayatri Spivak's suggestion of treating loss as loss. So, so we see Polumi Chakraborty uh, talking about uh, the legal definition of rape and the basic incommensurability between female understanding of rape and legal definition of it. So, how much a woman can talk about an incident that is based on the centrality of the phallus. She is not only acted upon, but in the entire discourse she has, she occupies a marginal and a uh, you know a very uh, she occupies uh, a marginal position where the question of reconstructing or or uh, uh, recounting 
bringing uh, the incident back uh, or, or reconstructing the inst incident through language again uh, is uh, challenging, it is difficult. Uh, and the question of believability, who is going to believe such a woman when she uh, uh, is trying to reconstruct uh, the incident uh, through language. Is there even uh, such a language that, uh, uh, that exists in a society? Uh, so, uh, in the river churning we see that the rape is not at the climax of the plot at uh, the outset. So, the rape incident happens at the beginning and so Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan reads it as a way of uh, of getting to a uh, I mean it is a way of uh, uh, arriving at a liberated narrative structure forming or, or shaping a liberated uh, narrative structure. So, Sundar Rajan would go on to say uh, that the position of the rape scene at the beginning preempts uh, expectation of its later occurrence. Not only is the scene of rape diminished by this positioning, but it is also granted a more purely functional purpose uh, in the narrative economy and narrative interest becomes displaced upon what follows. So, uh, so critics uh, note that the departure uh, of the river churning from the general narrative conventions where rape is uh, uh, always uh, uh, at the climax and uh, choosing to be silent on the details of the assault on Sutara, uh, what is the nature of the assault is something that the narrative never gives away. Uh, it offers as a result, it uh, it is a way of offering a critique of the linguistic community. Is there a language to tell Sutara's story without participating in the violence against her? Against her. So, is there a language to uh, tell, recount Sutara's story without uh, abetting, without participating in the violence against her? So, it puts the responsibility of receiving a difficult narrative on the hearer as much as on the speaker demanding a different uh, plane or a different form of listening, right. So, there is a, a point where the uh, novels, uh, uh, you know, there is, there is a point where uh, the narrator's uh, silence and Sutara's silence actually uh, resonate and uh, there is an agreement to remain quiet. Uh, so, that we can hear the inability, the, the disabled uh, nature of language uh, in the case of a marginalized character such as Sutara. So, Jildidur would say that the silence uh, in women's accounts of sectarian violence that accompanied partition is a sign of their inability to find a language to articulate their experience without invoking metaphors of purity and pollution and thereby subscribe and thereby uh, subscribing to the um, parameters uh, set forth by uh, patriarchy and the patriarchal society. Uh, with this I would like to stop today's lecture and we would meet again with another round of discussions. Thank you.